Okay, guys. Um, uh, thank you very much for joining us again on the FRCS uh, webinar uh, mentor groups. Um, we are uh, lucky today to have uh, Osman, Mohammed Osman uh, Khatak, who's uh, just recently passed exams. He's going to be giving us a talk on uh, dysplasia. Um, before we and we've got Abdullah Hanun, one, a new, uh, one of our new mentors. You've all heard him talk before. Um, so he'll be helping us as well. We're going to be doing Viva sessions at the end of the presentation. There may be some of them related to the, to the topics we're doing, and others will not be related. If you do want to be uh, Viva, please do put your hand up, and you do know we don't record those. So it's all for your benefit. We'll do it. Uh, our, we'll have some other mentors joining us soon, I hope. Okay. Mohammed, if you uh, want to go ahead. About the adult dysplastic hip, and this is a very commonly asked scenario. And here I'm going to give you an idea brief briefly if you get um, an x ray like showing above on the screen. And this is all about how you're going to tackle this question. So you need to have a system as to how to explain the x ray, what would be the questions that might be asked from you guys. And basically, this is not a trick question, and yet they're not going to ask you how you're going to do this hip replacement, but basically they want to know your thinking, your rationale, your planning behind tackling such a challenging case. So we, we start by simple things. So the mental dysplasia of the hip, it is one of the leading cause of adult, uh, young adult hip osteoarthritis in this country. And whenever you get a patient, whether it's your clinicals or it is your viva, who's a young patient, has got osteoarthritis, or you onset said osteoarthritis, just make sure that you think about either a dysplastic hip, either a congenital problem with the hip, such as Curtis or Sufi, or they've had a trauma or maybe an infection as well. So just keep those scenarios in mind because that's how your viva or your clinical case will pan out. Don't miss these things. So this, it is one of the leading cause of arthritis and the basic reason is that the anatomy is distorted. There is a, a normal contact stresses in the joint and these people do develop arthritis early on. Total hip arthritis is the, um, the, the inevitable uh, solution to them as they have become more stiff, more painful. And uh, it is a challenging procedure and we need to plan it properly and have a uh, game, plan in, uh, uh, game plan in mind. And these patients, like you have to tailor make the treatment for these patients, depending upon what the, the anatomy is like, what their age is, and you have to think about the whole of that uh, spectrum as well. Um, uh, it is challenging because it's a young patient, they are going to have revision surgery. You need to think about the implant that you are using uh, there are bony challenges associated with this problem. There are uh, uh, soft tissue challenges, and these patients do have a high failure rate and revision rates as well. So keep all of this in your mind when you are when you are structuring your answer for this problem. Now, the, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to show you an X-ray. So always have a system for explain uh, for describing your X-ray, and the main. The, the, the basic thing that I found easier was to start with the acetabulum and then make your way down. So with, 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 with such a hip, the x-rays, you need to co comment on the acetabulum. The acetabulum is going to be shallow. There is going to be lack of coverage, uh, either posteriorly, superiorly, anterior laterally. There is going to be proximal migration. The head might be distorted. There are going to be osteoarthritic changes. The version is going to be, it's mostly antiverted. The neck is going to be either in varus or valgus. Then you need to comment on the canal as well. And also in the acetabulum, do mention if you could see or localize the teardrop, which is the true floor of your acetabulum. And when you are talking about these things, the examiner would know that you know what you are talking about, what's going through your mind. And that's where you can show that you have got this ability of the higher order thinking going on with you. Because this is a surgical exam, they're going to take you towards the surgical management of this patient. And while you are describing the x-ray, you need to score all of these points. So be very systematic when you describe an x-ray, any x-ray, but with this, have a system like this in your mind. 
there are a few angles. Some of the examiners might ask you to draw them and might ask you, and this is not just for a dysplastic hip, you can use that for, uh, for, for any kind of dysplasia in a pediatric patient as well. And there are the three most common ones. And one of the examiners did ask me about two of these angles and he asked me to draw them. And he was more interested in knowing the normal values. So the center edge angle, it is the, the most commonest one. And that's how we draw it. As you see it in the picture, you can do a, practice a simple diagram of drawing this. And basically, if the angle is becoming um, narrow, if it's going less than 25 degrees, then there is adequate coverage, inadequate coverage of the femoral head and the stabulum is becoming shallow. Normally when it increases, when it increases quite a lot, then you get over coverage with it and you get your pincer kind of impingement with that dysplastic hip. So that's, that's one angle. The other angle is the tonus angle. This is not very commonly asked, but some people might get asked about this. One of my friends did get asked about this. So basically it's the angle that you, a line is drawn from the weight bearing um, area of the femoral head, which is called the sosral. And the other line is drawn towards the uh, lateral edge of the acetabulum. And it needs to be less than 10 degrees. If it's going more than 10 degrees, again, there is inadequate coverage as well. The other one is the your index. So you draw a line from the teardrop, or if it's a pediatric patient, so it's going to be a heterogeneous line, basically. And the other line is drawn towards the edge of the uh, lateral edge of the acetabulum, and that is 33 to 38 degrees is within normal limits. So that's what would be called a normal acetabulum as well. Now there are lots. Of, there are two main classification systems for ease. I, I memorized the Hartrophicaldus classification and it's, it's, it's very easy. So in A, the hip, the acetabulum is dysplastic, but the head is within the uh, true acetabulum. It's not uh, displaced, it's not dislocated. Then in B, the, thing to, the difference between B and C is that with the B, it's called the low dislocation and the femur goes up and it makes a, fall, a false acetabulum but the lower lip of the false acetabulum uh, uh, is overlying the true acetabulum. There is overlap between the two. And then in high distillation, there is no overlap between the false and the true acetabulum. As you can see in this image, it is quite high. So that's called the high dislocation. This was easier for me to remember than to confuse myself with the next one, that is the crow classification. You're talking about ratios, you're talking about lines, so in the YY, you would get confused easily. It's a stressful situation. So I found, found the heart of this easy. Some of you people might be using the Crohn's classification in your day-to-day -day routine, and you'd be more familiar with it. So stick to whatever, whichever one you like. But usually, it's this, uh, the heart of this I found easier. And um, now, uh, uh, they, they are going to take you towards the, uh, the surgical management and they are going to tell you that this is the x-ray, you will describe the x-ray, then they will tell you this is a patient 49 years of age, 48 years of age, and uh, they have exhausted all non-operative management and now how are you going to do this? So there are certain things that you need to talk about. So firstly, you need to say this is a challenging case. So you need to, and that's where your safety factor comes into play, that you've identified something that is challenging and that is difficult. You are going to discuss it with your colleague who is uh, doing these, dealing with these conditions, a young adult arthroplasty colleague. So, or you need to have, you need, you need to say this. Then starts your planning. So for the planning, you need to know the anatomy very well. You need to know where is the defect in the acetabulum, what is the version and all of this could be quantified by the CT scanning. So you need to mention a CT scan in your pre-op management and that would help you plan. You need to know how thin the medial wall is, um, what, is uh, 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 what is the version of your femur, where is the deficiency lying in your acetabulum and that will help you in planning. Then you talk about templating as well. So templating is very important with these patients then the things that you might require with this surgery. So it's, 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 it's common sense all that you would require a complex arthroplasty kit. You might need bone grafts. You are going to need tentalum uh, augments if there is lateral uh, coverage deficiency. 
If there is soft tissue problems, you might need a capture cup. You might need osteotomy kits if, uh, if you are doing a femoral osteotomy. Some patients may even require custom-made implants. So all of these things, so basically when you're answering this, this question, just think that you are going to plan and do a hip replacement on this patient. And basically what you are doing is you are thinking aloud. So the, you, you practice it and your thinking will be automatic and then you just be uh, uttering the words that you are thinking about and that's what they want to see. So uh, approach is very important. Uh, so we're going to do an interior approach or a posterior approach. If you look at various literature about the, uh, the, these, these hips, now for the, uh, the, the lower dislocations or the crow type one, type two, you can either use a posterior approach or you can use with your, go with your normal Harding approach. But with uh, most of the papers that, that you see on it, they do advocate that for high dislocations or crow type three, type four, it's the posterior approach, which would give you better exposure of the acetabulum and you would be able to protect the sciatic nerve with it because it is lying very close to the joint as well. Now, the other challenge that, that, that they ask, uh, they, they, that you are going to go with this, with every answer, you need to just uh, compartmentalize your answer. So when they ask you what are the challenges after your planning phase, so you would say there are bony challenges, there are soft tissue challenges. What are the bony challenges? The bony challenges are that there is um, uh, distorted anatomy, there is deficiency, the vestibulum is shallow, there is uh, inadequate lateral coverage, and then you ask the question, where are you going to put the cup? Whether you're going to put it into a false acetabulum, whether you're going to put it into the true acetabulum. And there are pros and cons with both of these, which I'm just going to talk to you about. The canal is narrow, the, the, the diversion, the, the neck is in various as well. And uh, so, so you, you, need, you need to talk about these bony challenges. And then coming to the true acetabulum. So as you can see in this image, uh, yeah, this has been restored down to the true acetabulum. And uh, this arrow about here is where they have made the osteotomy. Why they have made it, I will explain that in the next slide. This is just to give you an idea that it was quite a high dislocation and that has been restored down to the true acetabulum. So the advantages are, um, you are bringing it down so there is going to be shortening of the leg with the femur going up so you are restoring the length so leg length you are going to restore um, it will give you good bone stock for your future surgery you would be able to use a larger cup larger head size so that would give you more stability in your hip um, the there is going to be lower joint reaction forces that would decrease the revision rates as well so there's going to be less shear forces growing through the acetabulum Disadvantage is that it's quite a challenging surgery. Um, you are going to lengthen and stretch the soft tissues when you are doing this. The maximum you can do that is about four centimeter and you shouldn't be doing it more than four centimeter because you're going to be stretching all the soft tissues, especially the sciatic nerve and the blood vessels as well. And then you talk about the coverage of the cup. So the, you can accept about 30% of uncoverage on the lateral side, but not more than that. And so you would need some kind of uh, tentelium mental augments or, and bone grafts as well to get that coverage right. So it just, it, you just need to talk about the simple advantages and disadvantages that you might have with this. Then um, uh, in this one, you can see that it has been restored again and, and because they were lengthening it, they were stretching the soft tissues. So they have managed to do the osteotomy. So that would again make it challenging. Then coming down to the false acetabulum, if you're going to put in the cup in your false acetabulum, I'm really sorry the other image hasn't been loaded up of it, but there was an image of the cup being put into the false acetabulum. Again, this has got its advantages. It's easier surgery. You get better coverage of the cup um, and no osteotomy is required. You are not stretching out or lengthening the soft tissues as well. But the disadvantage is that in this, the joint reaction forces are high, more shear forces going through the false, uh, the, the, the acetabular cup, so higher revision rates. You're, you're not lengthening the leg, so you are not restoring any leg lengths. You have to use a small cup, small heads that would compromise the stability as well. And also because uh, the, the bone stock is quite limited in the false acetabulum, so 
there would be poor bone stock for your revision surgery. Then on the soft tissue side, uh, side of things, you have got insufficient uh, abductor musculatures. It might be they might be um, uh, uh, shortened. They might be contracted. So your hip flexors, hip extensors, they 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 are all quite short. The sciatic nerve would be short, and it would be lying more close to the joint, and is more likely to be prone to injury. And uh, the femoral artery is more lateral. And I've seen I've, I've worked with one consultant, and that he would. To do um, when there was quite a high dislocation, you would also get a CT angiogram. You wanted to know where the femoral artery is lying, and there is one kind of giving you the flavor is a thing that you might be asked about and that you need to know in your mind. And uh, these questions would be asked from you. This was one of the questions that was pitched in the new uh, in the Newcastle exam, uh, not the last one, the one before it. And um, they did ask the candidates about these things, the challenges that they, they might be facing. So that's how you are going to fashion your answer and answer these questions about uh, yeah, uh, adult uh, dysplastic hip in which you need to do a total hip replacement. Okay, so any questions for uh, this one or do you want me to move on to the next topic? Actually, um, so far, a very, very good, very uh, well laid out presentation. There was one question someone was asking, what is a tantalum augment? So it's, it's, it's a porous metal augment, so it's a special type of metal and some of these are hydroxyapatite coated and they, they, they encourage bone ingrowth and on growth and they are more stable than your normal uh, bony um, uh, allografts that you are going to use. A, they don't get dissolved and you can fix them as well using screws to get the uh, coverage of this tabulum on the lateral side. So are they the same as trabecular metal then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? If not, we can proceed, uh, Mohammed. Okay. Uh, no, sorry, it, there is. Uh, how do we decide low or high hip center? Yeah. Well, you have to you want to quantify it from the teardrop. That's how you're going to decide it. Where, how high is it from the teardrop? And that's why I like the heart of the classification that you 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 are quantifying it based on the overlap between the true and the false stabulum. So if the inferior lip of the false stabulum is um, overhanging or it's uh, into the true acetabulum. This means it is a, it is a low uh, dislocation, and then the high dislocation is when the two um, uh, acetabulums are completely separate. So you get a separate false, and you get a separate true acetabulum. I'll go back to this slide. So if you if you have a look at it, it would make more sense to you. So this 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 is no just normal displas the the dysplasia. In this, you can see that it is making a false acetabulum but there is an overlap between the true and the false acetabulum. And in this figure, you can see that there is, that's your true acetabulum and that's the false acetabulum. So that's your high dislocation. So that's why it's, it's, it's a much more simple classification system and it doesn't require a lot to, to you to memorize the ratios and all these lines. Okay. Um, um, is acetabulum uh, antiverted or retroverted in dysplasia? And sorry, I'm not sure I quite understand uh, Saranga's question. Um, you in in a dysplastic acetabulum, it is the it 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 is usually um, you can get antiversion is more common with these, but there there would be some uh, dysplastic changes that would cause it to be retroverted. But if you want to be on the safe side, it is usually antiverted. Okay, and of course you would be doing your CT uh, to establish what, what's going on anyway. Um, so, uh, Sarang, sorry, I didn't quite understand the gist of the question you've asked on the system, so I'm unmuting you if you, if you yeah. can ask it. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a question asked from uh, one of our consultant. Younger patient with high hips and uh, still, uh, are we going for I mean, high heart of Pilacidus type uh, C? Uh, then um, still are we going for high hip center or uh, we uh, try to 
bring back to the um, true acetabulum? Well, that 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 you see, that's that's where you will catch yourself out. So you don't need to make that decision in the exam when they ask you this question. Now, this is something that you are going to tell them that that's how I'm going to plan it. That's how it's going to be um, uh, a tailored made uh, uh, treatment plan for the patient. So if I'm doing a, um, uh, if I'm putting the cup in the false stabulum, these are the advantages. These are the disadvantages. And if I'm doing it in the true, these are the advantages, these are disadvantages. You know, and they know that you have never done a hip replacement on a patient like this. This is a very specialized procedure. It is usually done in, um, in tertiary lateral centers. Here in Birmingham, most of these hips are get referred to Royal Orthopedics in the uh, reconstruction department. And they, they deal with most of them because they have mm -hmm. got the resources, they have got the expertise to deal with this. And then you'll be looking at so you need to know what, what's the rationale behind it. What are the challenges that you are going to face? So you just need to know that. You, you, you do not need to commit yourself to what you are going to do. Yeah. Um, also, Saranj, the, you have to have a think about um, this isn't, these aren't black and white situations. They require complex thought behind them. So you, can't, you don't have a single answer for even that scenario you gave. It depends on how long it's been like this. Um, how short is the sciatic nerve, how much you can potentially extend it and so forth. There's a lot of other factors that you need to think about and not just young and not old. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, would you like to continue, Mohammed? Yeah. Very well done. So, uh, excellent presentation so far. So, the, the, the next topic we're going to talk about is the protrusio. So, here again, the, the, the thinking and the rationale is the same. That's why I wanted to do both of these together. Now, this is also a very commonly asked question. They, they are going to show you an x-ray like this of the pelvis and going to tell, you, uh, tell me what you see. So, basically, protrusio is the, is the medial uh, uh, migration of the femoral head. And, uh, and it is the Kohler's line, which is your uh, uh, ilioistial line that, that you take into reference on the pelvis. So if you look at it, that's, that's your Kohler's line, so ilioistial line, and you're going to see how much the medial migration is uh, from that, and that would quantify your protusio. So it is going to be a protusio estabula that you're going to be dealing with. Again, they are not going to ask you to do this surgery in exam, but they want to know how you are, if you see a patient like this, what's going through your mind? Uh, what are the challenges? Are you familiar with it? And if you are thinking about doing something, a hip replacement for this patient, how you are going to proceed and plan this, uh, this surgery for the patient. So again, you will go through the same steps. You need to know the x-ray. You need to know how to explain the x-ray. So the Kohler's line is very important. That's your reference line. And based on that, you are going to see how much is the medial migration. Now, this is a controversial bit. Like if you, somebody asks you to uh, define protrusio, you, you say that it is medial migration of the femoral head. But strictly by definition, if you look at it, even the Hearst paper, if you look into it, they describe the medial displacement of the of the of the acetabular dome or the medial wall of the acetabulum in reference to the Kohler's line. So you have to look into that. So you need to know where the Kohler's line is, and you need to tell the examiner where the Kohler's line is and why do you think it's protrusio because it is medial to the Kohler's line. Okay. So again, uh, if you look at this picture, that explains it very well. So that's on the on the right hand side, my right. It's it's the it's the normal hip, and on that side, if you look at the the Kohler's line, which is this line, the ilioistial line, the head and the acetabular wall has gone migrated medially to it. Okay. All right, and then uh, they do ask you how you are going to quantify this. I got this question in my exam, and it, the second question was how do you quantify it. So it's the Hearst classification, and it's based on the Hearst et al. paper from 1987. Now, it's, it's divided into three grades. Now, don't go, don't go crazy over whether in males it's this and in females it's this, this many millimeters. It's difficult to memorize this. You are going to confuse yourself or forget this in the virus situation. 
So just keep it simple, it's five to 10 millimeter, 10 to 15, more than 15. Just, just remember that grade one, two, and three. So that's how you're going to quantify the severity of it. Now the next question that they asked me that, what are the causes? So why do we, so, so basically again, with every question, anything you are asked about, you need to have a system. So there is idiopathic or the primary cause, which is the auto's pelvis. We don't know the cause for it. It's more common in females and it's usually bilateral. So that's the auto's, auto's disease. Then you've got the secondary causes. So you can either tell them about, about the secondary causes like this, or you can divide them and it's easier to remember them this way into metabolic, inflammatory, genetic, and traumatic. So it's very easy if you, if you memorize it like this, even if you remember two for each heading, that would give you a very good structure to your answer. Okay. And next, uh, they are going to tell you, and that, again, it's a challenging situation. It's not a straightforward hip replacement. I need to plan this properly. I am going to uh, consult with my um, uh, adult uh, hip, uh, young adult hip reconstruction colleagues as well, as to how I'm going to go about it. But uh, preoperatively, there are going to be challenges. So the first thing is, if there is any underlying secondary pathology like Pages disease, rheumatoid arthritis, you are going to make sure that patient is uh, optimized uh, uh, from that point of view. If it's Pages, they need to see a rheumatologist that needs to be controlled. If it's rheumatoid arthritis, you need to look into their um, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, you need to stop them and uh, you need to check their flexion extension views of the neck, make sure they're fit enough to undergo the anesthesia. Again, you are going to do a CT scan on this hip to understand the anatomy in a proper way and um, see uh, uh, what's the medial wall like. You are going to do templating on this hip as well. You are going to think about the approach to this hip, whether you're going to approach it from uh, my standard answer for these difficult ones was always that I'm going to go with the posterior approach. A, it would give me better exposure of the acetabulum. I would be able to protect the sciatic nerve with the posterior approach as well. You would need bone grafts. You would need allograft uh, uh, femoral heads, or you can use the patient's own head as well for a graft. And you need to be familiar with the uh, how you are going to do your impaction grafting. If there is a lot of loss, you might use mesh or cages. And um, the implant selection is important as well, whether you're going to the um, normal cemented acetabulum is going out of fashion with these, because you, if it's a thin wall and you have done bone grafting, you are going to um, compress the implant into the cement and that might push your graft out at the back. So more and more we are using hybrids uh, and uncemented cups for these as well. So implant selection is there as well. Uh, this patient might require more dissection. Uh, there might be damage to the, uh, to the abductors. So that's something you might like to say that I would like to keep an option of a um, capture cup or a constrained cup and liner available if the abductors are, are very, very damaged. And you are going to cross match blood for this patient as well preoperatively because you are going to do a lot of dissection. They might bleed a lot. So you need to talk about those things as well. And then intraoperatively, uh, if, uh, you are going to say, the, looking at the x-ray, it's going to be very difficult to dislocate this hip. And these hips are usually very, very difficult. And you need to do a neck osteotomy in situ for these where then you have to deliver the neck either with a corkscrew or a piecemeal, you have to deliver it. Again, thin medial wall, so you're going to be very careful when you're reading. you would be reconstructing the medial wall as well. And then with all these hip scenarios, you are working off your four main principles of your hip replacement. So you are restoring the center of rotation, you are restoring the offset, you are just restoring the, neck, uh, the leg lengths, and you are giving the patient a stable hip uh, within the primary arc uh, of movement. So these are the principles that you are going to talk about that you will restore the center of rotation, restore the offset. And it has been shown, if you look at the papers, the studies that have been done, if you restore the center of rotation, the longevity of the implant is quite good. There is a study from Bailey et al. Uh, I don't remember the year of that, 
but that's what they have shown that if you restore the center of rotation, then the survival of the implant is quite good. So again, it's a simple thing. If you have got the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the knowledge there as what you're going to talk about, basically they want to know how you are going to, uh, uh, to plan for this procedure. What, are you familiar with the challenges or not? So they are going to ask you questions regarding these things and that's how you're going to answer it. There's a couple of questions. Um, what's the difference between Cox uh, Profunda and uh, Protrusio? Coxa profunda. Um, it's it's a radiological definition. Um, Coxa profunda is when you have the acetabulum only protruding through the uh, the LUSQL line. The uh, protrusio is when you have the femur as well going through the medial line, medial to that line. So it's like the the first grade of the uh, protrusio, and uh, it's a radiological feature. Um, it's not something that, as, as, as surgeons, we would be interested in, probably. I've never heard many orthopedic surgeons talk about it, to be honest. The okay. uh, question is, how do you know your offset and center of rotation if both hips have protrusion? and what is your reference? So again, the reference you will take from the true floor of the acetabulum. And, uh, that's that's the, that's where the teardrop comes into play. So whenever you are expa explaining these X-rays, you always make sure if you could see the teardrop, you say I could visualize the teardrop, and that is where the true floor of the acetabulum lies. So you are going to bring it down to the true floor of the acetabulum. Okay. Um, and uh, Neville has asked, uh, what is the role of salvage or preservation surgeries, and what is the best time for these patients to have an orthoplasty? Well, again, it's, uh, it's the, the arthroplasty is your last uh, uh, resort, so you want to, you, you can try other measures with them, um, like physiotherapy, analgesia, steroid injections, all of these things, but if the patient is in pain, it's making their life miserable, then the end uh, result is uh, total hip arthroplasty. So it depends upon the patient. Again, you're going to say it's going to be an um, informed consent and shared decision making with my patient. I'm going to put everything to the patient, give them all the information they need, and then it's going to be a decision that we we'll take together in the best interest of the patient. So if you, if you, uh, I think Nabil is also kind of thinking along the lines of young adults slash uh, teenagers in the uh, in the dysplastic uh, developmental dysplasia group where we try to contain the hip and try to maintain the patient's own hip. Um, in those situations, it's reasonable to do uh, potential uh, preservation surgeries such as uh, uh, realignment surgery and so on. But in an adult, the, the question that then comes up is, if you're going to try and uh, do and put a do a realignment surgery, are you uh, then making it further difficult for your uh, arthroplasty? And when you're going to do an arthroplasty, well, that's a good question. The NJR has uh, some answers for that as well. So you can uh, take a look at the outcome in younger uh, hip replacements and how long the arthroplasties last. Any thoughts on that, guys? I think, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. The, the realignment surgery is for usually for patients in their early 20s or if they are very young patients, you, you, you cannot really offer them a hip replacement at a very young age. But then again, if you are talking about this, you have to mention that it is going to make future surgery for uh, an arthroplasty more challenging. Um, I, I've met some pediatric uh, surgeons that are doing young adult hip replacements. Um, there is a move towards that. I I'm, don't quote me on uh, 